Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, tomorrow, March 29th, was due to be one of the most historic days possibly in British history. However, as we know, it's not turning out that way. Richard Tice is one of the best known faces of the Leave campaign. He co-founded Leave.eu and just after the referendum, co-founded Leave Means Leave and he's with me today. Um, good to see you, Richard. Good to see you. What actually can people expect to happen tomorrow in terms of, as it were, events? Where can they come? So tomorrow, uh, we, Leave Means Leave, have the final day of our 14-day March to Leave, which started in Sunderland two weeks ago. Yeah. And the final day will start at Bishop's Park, Fulham, and march basically along the river to arrive in Parliament Square at around about four o'clock, where yeah. we're going to hold a huge, huge rally that will fill the whole of Parliament Square with tens and tens of thousands of people. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, you know, that was supposed to be as a celebration, yeah. But regrettably, as you've just indicated, actually, um, unlike the mood of the British people, parliamentarians have bottled it. They have completely and utterly lost their courage, lost their conviction, lost their belief in our great nation. And we're there to send a huge noise with some great speeches to Parliament, to the parliamentarians. Actually, do you know what, folks? Yeah. Just start to show some bottle. Start to show some belief in Britain. That's what we're there to do. Who are you going to have speaking, can you say? Yeah, we've got some great speakers. We've got uh, Julia Hartley Brewer, Kate Hoey, Tim Martin. We've got Brendan O'Neill, Claire Fox, Paul Embry, Peter Bone, Owen Patterson. So we've got a great team and Fantastic. Nigel Farage, of course. Mm. So yeah, we'll have some great short speeches and you know, it'll be a, uh, hopefully, a really well attended, rousing occasion uh, that actually just shows you know, the sense of belief in our great nation, as opposed to this sort of uh, extraordinary uh, sentiment amongst the people's vote, yeah, who yeah. actually, they clearly don't believe in Britain, yeah, yeah. and therefore um, they want to have the sort of protective umbrella of the, uh, the European Union. What has it been, you, you mentioned obviously there's been this march that started in Sunderland, what has the mood <coughs> been like? I mean look, people would could be forgiven for being utterly demoralized couldn't they i mean have you found that there's yeah i tell you the mood spirit? the mood has been fantastic yeah. the quantity of hoots and support from car drivers yeah. van drivers lorry drivers people coming out of houses with cakes and with chocolate biscuits you know, the mood has been uh, yes anger fury frustration yeah. <clears throat> but also tremendous conviction that actually we should get on with it we should leave with no deal, go to World Trade Organization rules and don't waste 39 billion pounds. So the mood of the country yeah. is strong and way ahead yeah. of the weak mood of parliamentarians. What do you think, I mean, as we stand here at the end of this week, it's hard for, you know, it's hard even for people in this bubble even to keep up with what's happening. It just seems to be, you know, changing day after day. What is your reading, actually, of the situation, apart from the fact that we've got these people who seem to have absolutely no stomach, what is your reading of the political situation? What do you think we can expect in the next week? I think in the next week you'll see some more parliamentary games going on, possibly on Monday around all these indicative votes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but all of that, I mean, they, all of this really is games. The reality is, yeah. I don't think that the Prime Minister will get the withdrawal agreement through the House of Commons. Uh, the DUP are resolute against it. There is a, a bedrock of the European Research Group and a few others that are resolute against it. So I don't think she'll get the numbers. Yes, uh, some are beginning to, uh, to go over to it just to try and take it uh, over the line. But let's remember, this withdrawal agreement is the worst deal in history. Yeah, yeah. It chains us like slaves mm. to the European Union and we give the key to the padlock to the people in Brussels. So I think that will fail and then I expect that uh, rather than have the courage and the conviction and the belief uh, that's the mood of the country, I suspect that MPs will bottle it again and will ask the European Union in 10 days' time or so for a further extension for a year or so. And then you're into the European elections and I have yeah. to say, why would anybody, mm. anybody want to go out and vote Conservative? You don't know what you're voting for. Exactly. All you know is you're voting for incompetent negotiators. Mm. Uh, why would anybody want to go and vote for Labour? What are you voting for? No one's any idea what their view is. Um, I can understand, uh, you know, 
uh, clear Remain voters saying, I'll vote for the Lib Dems. Um, but otherwise, I think, uh, you know, you could see extraordinary thing happen with Nigel Farage's new Brexit party. Yeah. With, with the institutions, obviously we talked about their lack of uh, resolve, that's putting it mildly, uh, in the way they've behaved. But you've been active now in the Leave campaign for a long time. Has your attitude to our institutions, to Parliament, how has that changed? Has it changed over that period? Oh, without question. I think uh, we have learned a lot. I think people across the country have learned a lot yeah, yeah. about, uh, frankly, uh, the way our MPs uh, behave, but also about the civil service. You know, more and more evidence is coming out about actually how the civil servants have deliberately yeah. thwarted yeah. and uh, worked against the interests of the country, against the interests and directions from Brexit ministers. And I think when this is over, there needs to be a serious public inquiry into what has gone on and how parts of the elite establishment have basically tried to prevent the democratic will of the country. And some very, very serious consequences need to come out of this. Mm. Some serious lessons learned and a lot of change needs to come out of it. And I think the other thing is that um, <clears throat> there, there, there is a big shift in British politics going on in that I think m now we're looking at voters no longer being tribal Labour or Conservative. Yeah. I think there's a difference emerging in culture. Are you an optimistic, hopeful person who believes in Britain, who's prepared to take on a bit of risk because you see huge opportunities? If you are, you're much more likely to be a global Brexiteer. Or are you a little bit cautious, a bit nervous, a bit anxious, and you prefer the cosy, warm, yeah. um, but rather burdensome uh, blanket of the European Union, in which case you're someone that actually uh, wants to reverse Article 50. You're actually someone who no longer believes in democracy. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Because when you look at the various options they've been looking at in Parliament, uh, or even on the, on the telly when you see it being uh, discussed, revoking Article 50 is now talked about in this casual way, isn't it? It's extraordinary what actually that means, isn't it? It is absolutely extraordinary. And as I was just saying, you know, I think it... Uh, it shows that um, the belief in democracy, yeah. uh, you, these people, they only believe it when it goes their way. And the whole People's Vote campaign yeah. has actually shown up to be a bit of a sham. The truth is they don't actually want a second referendum, they just want to revoke it. Yes, exactly. And yeah. uh, you know, that truth is now coming out and we need to hold, you know, make people really understand what this is all about because it's incredibly serious. You know, there's a proper danger, serious danger, that democracy is dying in this country. And when people no longer believe in democracy, they either don't vote or they won't vote for centrist parties. Yeah. They will vote for extremist parties yeah. uh, at either end of the spectrum. I think there are quite a few people who came out specifically for the referendum. And they have maybe have gone back, as it were, inside themselves. That is the worry, isn't it? They're, they're looking course, at this. Because it, and it's an absolute tragedy. Yeah, yeah. People who had never voted yeah. in their lives, they suddenly realised their vote counted for something. Mm. They were told by the Prime Minister and the government mm. and all the great and the good that this was a once in a generation decision. Mm. And now they've been told, you're too old, too thick, too stupid, yeah. you come from the wrong part of the country, you don't deserve a vote. Yeah. I tell you, this is big stuff, massive consequences and, and parliamentarians need to be really very, very careful what they're doing. I think it's, it's an extremely important point you made though because this thing of you know, being called racist, thick, uneducated, little England, all of these things, it seems to me that people might have had a suspicion that they were considered that way before, but now there's no doubt. They know what the establishment think of them, don't they? They absolutely do. They do, and uh, you know, they are, um, people are really very yeah. angry indeed. And, and the benefit of walking day after day through the length of the country yeah. is that you really sense this. Yes. And the other extraordinary thing is, look, I've no problem with people saying, um, you know, I disagree, vote remain. What's extraordinary was on the few on the occasions when uh, you know someone against Brexit uh, you know shouted at us. They didn't just say vote remain. The expletives, the yeah, hideous, yeah, yeah. abusive language, hatred yeah. from coming out of cars or coming from all sorts of cyclists, in particular last Sunday. I just find mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. You know why do you need to be quite so hateful, hateful and yeah. rude and abusive? Look, we live in a democracy. It's perfectly legitimate to have a debate. Uh, you can remain friends. Mm. Uh, you know, I've got great friends on the Remain side, but you don't need to hurl incredibly hideous, um, insulting, 
yeah. rude, sexist, sexist uh, comments at people. You know, that's hardly going to help arrive at a, uh, you know, a solution and take the country forward. You've been doing a huge amount of media, I mean, over the past few years, Question Time, the rest of it. I mean, I think the, isn't it true to say that the media, the part they played is has been pretty appalling too? Uh, certainly when it comes to the broadcast media. Yeah, I think uh, without question, uh, you know, the, the main parts of the broadcast media, have, you know, they are part of the establishment. Yeah, yeah. They've had a very clear agenda. I think in fairness to the BBC, I think they, they, they were reasonably good uh, during the referendum. During the campaign. But yeah. since then, it's been basically, uh, you know, all breaks off, yeah. just uh, relentless. Everything has been despite Brexit. Mm. And, you know, there's been really very little reference mm. to the incredible good news within the economy, mm. uh, proving that all of the scaremongering, complete and utter bunkum garbage. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think there does need to be an inquiry into how the media have behaved. There is a difference, of course, between the BBC and Sky. Sky is a profit-making enterprise. It's a private business. Actually, um, it can adopt whatever stance it, it wants, just like any newspapers. The BBC is different. It is a taxpayer-funded entity, funded by all of us. It's our money. And the only point of having a national broadcasting mm. service paid for by taxpayers is that it is seen to be impartial and presenting a fair and balanced view. If not, frankly, scrap it and just go commercial. I think that there is BBC, Parliament, or as you said, civil service, all of our institutions. Uh, the breakdown of trust, I think, now is palpable. Uh, this is going to have massive repercussions for our culture coming on, isn't it? It is. And, but you know what? I actually think that that's part of the benefit of this whole process. Yes, indeed. We, you know, yeah. My glass yeah. is always half full. It's yeah. never half empty. Yeah. And I think that more and more people are just realising how badly governed we are yeah. by politicians and by civil servants. And this old adage that we've got the best civil service in the world is pure and utter nonsense. Yeah. Uh, you know, frankly, from what I've seen and learnt, they don't work that hard. They can't be trusted uh, to deliver what politicians are instructing them. And actually, very often, um, they're not that competent. And yeah. so there needs to be a proper reassessment of the way that um, you know, departments are led. I would much favour, for example, rather like they have in the American executive, where a new Secretary of State coming into a department could bring in a dozen, 15 people from the private sector to take you know, the helm of that department and frankly, shake it up, be there for three or four years and then move on. And I think we need to build in a culture amongst the private sector where you need to do a stint uh, working within government um, as part of your CV uh, as you go forward. You know, if we build in that, at the moment, it's, you've got twin tracks. You're either in the civil service for life or you're basically in the private sector for life. There's very, very little crossover. Mm -hmm. And actually, that is not serving our country well. And I think that's one of the big debates when we get through this. So in some ways, really, this has been cathartic, hasn't it? In a, yes, in a most it has. Way. And, and actually, let's view that as yeah. a positive thing yeah. um, amongst all the division yeah. and the grief. But look, politics is always divisive. It was divisive between Labour and Conservative. This has been cathartic. There's a shift in politics. Mm. Um, we need to uh, get over uh, the sort of the, the uh, insidious abuse that goes on. Twitter clearly doesn't help that. Social media doesn't help that because you can hide behind the keyboard. Um, and so we need to bring back a, a respect. And I think that's actually, with concerted effort on all sides, mm. I think that's uh, completely possible. Um, but then we really need to uh, have a proper reassessment of the way that we're governed the institutions and how we can make it so much better. Well, look, Richard, uh, thank you. Uh, just one, just just to recap, tomorrow, right? People watching this, maybe today, where should they come and at what time? Uh, either go to uh, Bishop's Park in Fulham yeah. for about uh, 11, 15, yeah. 11 30 If you want to walk the six or seven miles along the uh, the river path uh, to Parliament, but the vast majority of people, uh, I'd recommend be at Parliament Square. Four o'clock on the dot. Uh, speeches will start at 4.30, give or take, and it'll be a huge, busy, noisy, rousing occasion. Uh, you know, a, a, a sign of confidence, a sign of belief, yeah. a sign of conviction. Uh, so frankly, uh, take half a day off, make sure you're there, otherwise you're going to miss out. Thanks so much. I certainly will be there, so I shall see you and, and hear you, in, in fact. Fantastic. Thanks very much indeed. Nice thank you. you. Uh, thanks. So see you next time on So What You're Saying Is. Thank you.